EU and the U.S. have imposed sanctions on a number of Russian and Crimean officials over their support for the referendum. For more on this, I'm now joined live by Anastasia Turkina. Anastasia, thank you so much for joining us here. Now, uh, what do we know about these measures? Do tell us more. Well, uh, Marina, what we know is these measures come as a sort of second wave of muscle flexing that we've seen, seen come from the United States when it comes to the situation surrounding the Crimean referendum. Certainly, the U.S. and uh, the EU, for that matter, have been saying even days ahead before the referendum took place that it would be rejected, that it's considered illegal and against the Ukrainian constitution. So certainly the latest measures, the second set of sanctions, the first one having taken two weeks ago, uh, basically is no surprise. And uh, as uh, you U.S. officials had warned it is uh, a list of sanctions against uh, seven Russian officials, among them the head of Russia's Federation Council, a deputy prime minister, and an aide uh, to Russian President Vladimir Putin, and um, four Ukrainian officials, including uh, uh, ousted Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych. What these sanctions include are certain uh, asset freezes and travel bans, curiously, uh, and visa bans. And we've we've heard some comments being made from certain Russian officials saying, "What if?" we don't have any assets to freeze and so certainly um, this comes as something quite expected in Moscow. Now this list is bound to grow according to European Union, uh, similar sanctions imposed on 21 Russian officials from a wider list. So it's important to keep in mind that these sanctions seem to be only in the first stages, and we are expecting the list of Russian officials to be uh, uh, included in these sanctions to grow. Now, we've heard um, just minutes ago from U.S. President Barack Obama speaking on the Crimean referendum, where he basically said there's still room for dialogue unless provocation from, from Russia ends. And we do know that the position of the U.S. has largely been really blaming Russia for every everything that's been unraveling on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, he'll be traveling to the EU next week, where likely the sanctions between the U.S. and EU will be on the table. And I'll be traveling to Europe next week. All right, Anastasia, thank you so much for bringing us this update from Washington, D.C. Anastasia Turkin alive there. Well, despite hawkish rhetoric from politicians, European businesses are taking a more cautious approach, warning that the EU itself has plenty to lose from sanctions. Russia is the European Union's third largest trade partner. Nearly a half of the cars made in the EU end up in Russia, as does 18 percent of chemical production. Plus, European consumers get one third of their natural gas supplies from Gazprom. And then there's a huge profits from food exports to Moscow. But that's only half the story. Russia's contribution to the global economy is also not to be underestimated. Take metals, for instance. 20 percent of the world's titanium comes from Russia, a metal used in industries from aviation to jewelry. Nearly half the world's palladium, which makes your car greener, is mined in Russia as well. Then there is Russia's massive contribution in platinum, diamonds and many other minerals. So any disruption in the supply of those commodities is bound to reverberate across the global economy. Now, let's talk about the sanctions in more detail with financial markets expert Patrick Young, who joins me live from Poland. Patrick, it's always great to have you with us here on the show. Well, as we heard, uh, the U.S. and the EU are imposing sanctions on Russia, uh, on certain Russian and Crimean officials, I should say. What, if any, impact do they expect uh, to have uh, At this juncture, what we have is really only some sort of statement of impact. I mean, essentially, the European Union, allied to the United States of America, have put together a list of people and they've said, oh, they're very important. And of course, the idea is they're trying to create fear. They're ultimately trying to create an impact that the Chelsea set, who are uh, so ensconced in SW3 in London, and other Russians who travel overseas, will start to be afraid and that hopefully they will somehow or other cause the Russian situation to change in the Crimea. So therefore, these are very, very much essentially open, simple statements of fact, because, of course, the biggest problem is that the next step to actually get towards tangible economic sanctions could be very difficult, because the European Union needs unanimity of all 28 members to move forward. Well, you know, Barack Obama just said that these targeted measures are just an initial step. I mean, should Moscow expect more? 
Well, what's already been said is, I mean, this is step two of a three-step process. The first was to flounce out of negotiations about going to things like the G8 at Sochi and talking about visa liberalisation. We're in stage two. We've got this list, initially something like 21 people. It could reach 130 people by the end of the week and could expand. And then, of course, we get to effectively the nuclear option. Phase three is the point where essentially proper, hard-hitting trade sanctions might take place. The problem with that, of course, is the fact that, well, let's look at it this way. In the Cold War, we infamously had weapons of mass destruction and we had this thing called mutually assured destruction. Whoever launched a missile attack first that was nuclear, the other was going to wipe it out. Now what we've reached is actually mutually assured economic destruction because realistically, although there are 28 nations in the European Union, although they're also backed by the United States of America, none of those economies are really performing so strongly that they can truly expect not to be harmed quite significantly if they suddenly impact Russia. Because, of course, Russia will retaliate and Russia holds a huge number of trump cards in this discussion. Well, it uh, looks like no one benefits from these sanctions. And in the worst case scenario, the countries that impose those sanctions will be also hit by, um, you know, the sanctions that will um, return to them. That will backfire. Now, uh, the last question that I'd like to ask you before we let you go is of the financial help that uh, the EU is offering Ukraine, and that's $15 billion. Um, can the bloc really afford to help Ukraine, given the dire straits that it is in now itself? We're in a situation where, frankly, the European Union has for a long time been in the economics of la-la land. They're now talking about multiple billions of euros, but they're quickly trying to caveat that because, of course, they're terrified. How can you possibly reasonably operate, essentially, a domestic policy within the European Union across 28 countries that leaves behind 50% of Greek youth unemployed, that has 30-plus percent of the Spanish unemployed? This is an organisation in chaos economically. The euro currency doesn't work. It doesn't have the ability, the flexibility to devalue in the same way per nation as, in fact, Russia has with the ruble. So, therefore, it is, frankly, political hypocrisy of the first order what has been going on recently because certainly no one in Europe is in a position where they want to give their money to Ukraine because all of the European nations have far, far too many problems going forward. And therefore also, how can they possibly turn around and say that suddenly we're not going to be able to build Airbus planes because of a lack of titanium or indeed that we're going to stop exporting 100 billion euros worth of cars just from Germany and the United Kingdom them that end up in the streets of Moscow and around Russia. Ultimately, the European Union is playing with fire, and it's playing with fire two months ahead of very important elections to the European Parliament, where we're likely to see an incredible growth in extremists. And why are those extremists coming along? Because they've given up hope in the madness of the Brussels apparatus that says that it's going to give money willy-nilly to the Ukrainians, but isn't going to deal with the problems at home. That, frankly, is a huge economic impasse and very worrying. All right, Patrick Young, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us here on RT International.